oceans are mysterious and seemingly endless. There are creatures that are curious and intelligent, but have neither teeth nor bones, the giant octopus. They live in the kelp forests of the northern Pacific Ocean. This is where we will observe them and film them. Another location is the Revilla Gijero Islands off the coast of Mexico. Here we will search for the mysterious Humboldt squid. And we will be there when sailfish and manta rays hunt off the coast of Benedicto. The Humboldt squids only come to the surface during a full moon. This is where they hunt, and they are dangerous. Our adventure starts in Europe in Portugal. The fishing harbor of Lisbon is busy every morning. The Atlantic trawlers come in with their profitable catch, despite the fact that the waters off Portugal are heavily overfished. The demand for fresh fish is increasingly high. Upon closer inspection, we see many octopuses and squids. They still seem to be plentiful here. We expected that. The city on the Tejo, surprisingly, this is where we will find a squid that only few have seen alive. It is Architeuthis, the legendary giant squid and it's located behind the walls of this aquarium, the Aquario Vasco da Gama. The first thing that we notice are the teeth around the giant suckers. The entire animal is 24 feet long, and its tentacles are each six feet. Architeuthis has a horrible weapon, a large beak with which it's able to severely wound or kill its prey, as in the case of this sperm whale. Several years ago, this squid was found in the fishing net of a Portuguese fishing trawler. The aquarium is proud to have this incredible find on display here. <laughs> Professor Aldina is one of the leading experts for giant squids. The rather large eyes and head of the squid are very noticeable. Architeuthis only has one enemy and that is the sperm whale. A fight between a sperm whale and a giant squid can go either way. It's those barbed hooks around the suckers of the squid that can severely wound a sperm whale. Many sperm whales bear scars all over their bodies. One thing is for sure, Architeuthis does not only live in the South Pacific, but also in the oceans off Europe. This male sperm whale weighs about 66,000 pounds and it's hungry. It hasn't eaten anything in days and has to dive deep to find a giant squid, possibly down to 3,000 feet or more. On its way into the deep, it passes these comb jellies, incredibly beautiful and graceful. Many of the jellies and fishes down here are equipped with a sophisticated light system in order to lure in their prey, or also a mate.
This is one of the rarest of them all down here, the viper fish. Amastigotuthis, a close relative of the giant squid, has ejected white ink for protection. The white ink seems strange at first, but makes total sense, because nobody would see the black ink that their shallow water cousins use down here in the total darkness of the deep sea. Another rare inhabitant of this hostile world, Trichiurus is what biologists have named this eel-like fish. A bright red Cirrochuthis. A creature seemingly made of glass. This small squid has not been named yet. It's completely unknown to science. Will Cirrochuthis hunt this clear squid? All of a sudden, a defensive response from the glass-like creature. But where is Architeuthis? Only this animation will allow us to find Architeuthis. The sperm whale is going deeper. Its biosonar leads the whale precisely to its prey. The whale's clicks capture Architeuthis. A fight that will not always end in victory for the whale, but this time it will. We've left the Atlantic Ocean and have traveled to the Pacific, near the Sea of Cortez, off the Revilla Gijedo Islands. The Solmar 5 is on its way to Roca Partido, an island in the archipelago. We are searching for a direct cousin of Architeuthis, the Humboldt squid. The team is still in a jolly mood but that will change soon. Captain Pedro Ramirez knows these waters like the back of his hand. Dolphins are leading the way. It's a large school of them, and they love to play in the wake alongside the ship. The Solmar 5 is not fast enough to keep up with them, but the ship is still a welcome distraction for the playful dolphins. crew, on the other hand, only has eyes for their equipment. Nothing must go wrong. This is going to be our dive site, a rock in the middle of the surf where ships can't anchor. Big Eye Trevallis are gathering underneath the ship. These volcanic rocks reach several thousand meters out of the deep. Despite the strong surf, there are also quiet areas, but they are few and far between. That's where harbor seals and sea lions like to rest and fight for the best spots. We're in the middle of the ocean, and there's an abundance of food here but places to rest are scarce and hard to come by.
Despite that, everybody is trying to get along. Sea lions are excellent divers, but their main reason for being out here is the food. Otherwise, they would have left this inhospitable rock already. The colony consists of several hundred animals divided by harems and jealously guarded by their respective male. These sea lion cubs were born in May and are gently tended to by their mothers. The mothers are very busy tending to their young and are rarely able to rest right now. If a baby gets lost between the other animals, it will call for its mother and she will immediately recognize the voice of her own young amongst all the others. The mothers will go in the water if they really need peace and quiet for a moment. They actually take a little nap here. Not just the mothers are stressed out, also the fathers. The bulls have to watch over their harem on the surface and also underwater. Giant schools of sardines are the basic food source for these mammals. This particular source of fish has been getting more and more attention from fishermen as well, and the sardines have been decimated significantly. Not for human consumption, but for chicken feed. Roca Partida means split rock. We want to dive in the surf zone. The powers of nature around this rock are apparent, even underwater. The divers are faced with strong currents and a constant surge of the waves. The visibility, on the other hand, is excellent, 150 feet and more. Big eye trevelis are very aquadynamic. They are pelagic fishes and can deal with any current. A manta ray appears, fishing for plankton with its mouth wide open. The steep Roca Partida looks like a Swiss cheese underwater with numerous caves. This is where white-tipped reef sharks rest. These caves were created by large gas bubbles during volcanic eruptions. White-tipped reef sharks have an exceptional characteristic that makes them different from most other shark species. They can actively breathe, which means they don't have to constantly swim in order to breathe. Depending on need, they move their gills and mouth in order to take in oxygen. Our cameraman is trying to get as close as possible to these sharks. The animals observe this intruder closely because he's blocking their entrance. What are the benefits for the sharks to rest in these unusual places? The answer is easy. The current is very strong in this area, and they would use too much energy to swim against it. Therefore, they seek out these protected areas to rest. Not every cave is suitable for every shark. The younger ones search for smaller caves. 
Scientists who have observed these sharks for longer periods of time found out that the same sharks always seek out the same caves. The same picture on a lower floor. The hierarchic structure in this cave is identical. The walls of the caves have been worn smooth by the sandpaper-like skin of the many generations of sharks that have come into these caves. This bass does not seem to fear the sharks. It doesn't need to because this is not their time of day to hunt. They will start feeding at dusk and into the night. Cameraman Mike Ricciardi has entered one of the caves and makes a surprising find. Chimeras live in this cave. They also belong to the family of sharks. They avoid the daylight and live exclusively in the dark. It's dangerous to explore these caves. There's a strong undertow in the tight passageways of the cavern. These bright red stone crabs don't like the light. They typically live deeper in the ocean. But these caves are their land of milk and honey because the strong current sweeps food in and out. It feels like a rebirth to leave the caves, even for an experienced diver. A highlight for every diver, and especially underwater cameraman, to film a small school of marlins during their hunt. These lightning-fast hunters showed up suddenly because their prey is a school of sardines. They work together and control the movements of the bait ball. The spear-like snout is almost three feet long and a dangerous weapon. They could easily spear us and we would not be able to defend ourselves. Filming these rare fishes is very dangerous and more feared by most teams than working with sharks. The behavior of the sardines offers them protection. The predators have a difficult time to separate individual sardines from the ever-moving ball. They have to attack the bait ball over and over to be successful. Marlins have two options to hunt. They feed on smaller fishes directly with their mouth and larger ones can be speared. The sardine bait ball is coming closer and closer to us, which makes it more and more dangerous. The team is getting very tense and it's time to leave this spot. Better safe than sorry. All of a sudden, another rarity. Manta rays have appeared, and there are more and more of them. What are they doing here? After feeding, these giant rays like to have their gills cleaned by cleaner fishes. The rays know where to find their favorite barber shop and come there as needed. It's fascinating to watch. Surprisingly, the manta rays let us get very close.
and beautiful. Captain Ramirez sets course towards Benedicto, our next destination. The island chain of the Ravilla Hijedos consists of several small islands. Some are separated from each other by more than 62 miles, but are connected underwater by an enormous underwater mountain range. Pacific white-sided dolphins have found our ship again and are playing in the wake. Always a welcome sight, even for professional cameramen. But our hope for the night is to find the Humboldt squids. Benedicto. Compared to Roca Partida, this island is much larger. Strong rains have eroded this island and given it its rugged look. The film crew is planning an experiment for the night dive. They're discussing what they will be doing. One of the many gannets that live around here has come to see what's going on. The bird is not shy at all. These islands are known for their spectacular sunsets. Last equipment checks. The crew doesn't know what's waiting for them down there. They're hoping to find the dangerous Humboldt squid, but they will be surprised to find even more excitement. The lights of the boat have attracted a group of Galapagos sharks. It will be a gamble to jump into the water right now. Too dangerous, but we still want to get our pictures. The crew decides to use a remote pole cam. It would still be a loss if it got destroyed, but better to lose a camera than a limb. The sharks are getting more and more aggressive. It's quite spectacular, especially within the safety of the ship. According to biologists, this shark species is very dangerous. Attacks on divers are not uncommon, so it's not advisable for divers to go in the water in the early evening hours. This is the time of day when most sharks start to feed. It's been well documented that there is a higher concentration of sharks found around boats due to the lights. The crew is a bit concerned about their expensive camera equipment, but it seems to be fine with a few minor scratches. The risk to go in the water is high, but the chance to find the squids is equally as high. The team has decided to go in all together at once to minimize the risk for each individual, as the divers are jumping into the midst of the sharks. The team knows that the sharks are easier to control once they're underwater, and then all of a sudden the sharks are all gone. And there it is, the legendary Humboldt squid. It looks exactly like a smaller version of Architeuthis. The Humboldt squid can grow up to 12 feet. It has thin, whip-like tentacles and rhombic fins. These squids are hunting for the mackerel that are drawn to the lights of our boat.
they have come up from a great depth. We won't have much time to film them, and we have to be careful. We know from other film teams that these squids can pull divers with them into the deep. Camera assistant Alex has a hard time to keep this squid away from him. The team has long forgotten the dangerous Galapagos sharks that seem to have disappeared for some reason. Is it the presence of the powerful Humboldt squids? Large dark eyes and even larger rhombic fins are the most striking characteristics of these giant squids, next to their ferocious tentacles, of course. The large beak of the squid is located in the center of the tentacles. It looks similar to the horned beak of a parrot, and the animal can mortally injure its prey with it. There seems to be lightning inside their bodies. These are light signals that are created by a contraction of skin cells. And yet another surprise, two squids attack each other. And with that, we have had enough for the night. Our film adventure into the mysterious world of the squids and octopuses continues on to British Columbia, to Vancouver Island. Dense fog surrounds the Malay Islands, located to the north of Vancouver Island. The fog creates a mysterious light. Our ship is called Shalon, and the captain knows his way around the many small islands and rocks in these waters. On board are the biologists Karen Palmer and David Pickles. They're preparing for a dive together with us to find the legendary giant octopus that lives here in the Pacific. Captain David Luxford takes us through one of the many tight passageways around here. The current is very strong. It carries the nutrient-rich water with it. Captain Dave spots an orca hunting for seals. The diversity of creatures up here is just incredible. One of them is the stellar sea lion, one of the largest of its kind. There's an abundance of fish in the waters around these islands. Bald eagles profit from that as well. Their population is ever increasing. The divers have to bundle up in order to dive in this water. It's not more than 39 to 42 degrees Fahrenheit. The dry suits are cumbersome and weigh quite a bit, together with the additional weights that are needed for a dry suit. It's important to stay warm down there, but nevertheless, the divers will be shivering coming out of the water later on. A small pod of orcas has come closer to the boat. The underwater world up here is unexpectedly beautiful. Large laminaria, better known as kelp, have made a home in the plankton-rich water. They're kept on the surface by gas-filled thallus bladders. Tritoneoidea, 
an unusual type of nudibranch has made a home here. Karen and David have been expected. This giant octopus has already seen them and is now moving towards them. Octopuses are part of the mollusk family, just like squids. Their evolution has been underway for several hundred million years. The Latin name octopus refers to their eight tentacles. Each of them can have up to 240 suction cups, which each work like a vacuum and are surprisingly strong. They move with the help of jet propulsion, but also by walking and swimming. Their eyes are very highly developed, but their hearing is terrible. They are constantly checking their environment. One of their most interesting features is the ability to camouflage and mimic in order to blend in with their habitat. The animals can change the color and also the texture of their body surface. In the thick kelp forest, we discover another Tritonioidea. They're also part of the mollusk family and feed on the polyps that are attached to the algae. The nudibranch will use the poison of the polyps it ingested for its own protection. Their striking coloration signals to their enemies that they will get burned if they try to feed on them. There are also many crustaceans in these waters. The king crab is one of them. Between the algae and plumose anemone, we find a very unusual ocean inhabitant, a grunt fish. It can't swim, but walks on its petrol films. Grunt fishes can even climb up the reef, but currently this little guy is busy feeding. This habitat is equally as mysterious as its inhabitants. Many of the creatures here are rather curious. A seal that's not shy at all. At the beginning of her research, Karen was not sure how to behave around the octopuses. She tried to pet them like a dog, and they seemed to like it. It's quite remarkable how octopuses use their tentacles. How are they able to move all eight of them together and not get them knotted up, no matter if they're walking, swimming, hunting or feeding? When the octopus feels that it's enough, it just changes its colors in the hope that the cameraman will lose sight of it. They truly are the chameleons of the oceans. They are the kings of hide and seek. No crack is too tight for an octopus to squeeze through. But not all of them feel the need to hide. It seems that some of the animals really like to interact with humans. Karen loves to show off her skills in front of the camera 
and the octopus seems to enjoy it. David also feels that the more he and Karen interact with them, the more they will learn from the animals. Even our cameraman seems to be interesting to the octopus. It's curiously checking him out. Now it's had enough. The octopus tucks in its tentacles and swims away without any haste and very relaxed. There are others down here that don't look like they could swim, but they do just fine. This feather star wants to move to another position. But the uncrowned king is the wolf fish. Playing with a fish that can easily crush an arm is not for the faint-hearted. But it's not food that the fish is after. Our safety diver, Rob Selinski, found out that the wolf fishes always responded to the warmth of his hands when he took off his gloves to pet them. There's obviously only a minimal temperature difference, but the fish is enjoying his gentle, warm touch nevertheless. They only react this way to a bare hand. It was a sensation for marine biologists to find this out. But who would not like a nice, toasty belly rub in these freezing cold temperatures down here? There are no compromises. Everyone wants their turn. Karen and David have their favorite wolf fishes. These animals are faithful to their spot in the habitat, and this one in particular because it's been getting fed by Karen for years. One bite is enough to break the shell of this crab in half. She has to be careful with her hand. If the wolfish accidentally bites down on it, it will be smashed like a potato. Wolf fishes are part of a close-knit family. The female also lives in this cave and wants her share of the treat. Time to play is unfortunately over for Karen and David. They need to get back to their work and are here to count how many octopuses live in this area for their statistics. This is a newbie. The octopus will be taken up to the boat where it will be measured, weighed and tagged. This way the biologists are able to track the movement of the octopuses in a certain area. It's not always easy to catch them though and it takes quite a bit of time. Octopuses are masters of escape. Captain Dave is getting worried. Their dive time should come to an end soon. Karen and David's job is not just counting octopuses for their statistics. There's a new danger during the summer months threatening the animals a poisonous algae bloom, another result of climate change. The food sources of the octopuses, such as crabs and mollusks, are dying off as a result of the algae blooms. Or the octopuses ingest the poison with their food. This is a young female. She's getting tagged, but she's not making this easy. This little Houdini has many tricks up her eight sleeves to avoid being handled. The tag will not disturb the animal. Let's get the bag. 
It's more difficult than they thought. Finally, and now she will be weighed. Almost 22 pounds. She has a healthy weight for her size. Karen and David are happy that she's in such good health. Karen also names the octopuses they catch. This one will be Marilyn. Now the visibility underwater is terrible. It's important to release Marilyn exactly where she was caught. Octopuses have incredible eyesight and intelligence. Despite the terrible visibility, the biologists are able to find the location. It seems that she has started to like her temporary home in the bag. She recognizes her habitat right away and goes straight to her cave. Karen and David work for the Department of Marine Biology at the University of Victoria. Although they prefer to study the animals in the wild, they also have octopuses in these tanks. Primarily, the tanks are used to breed fish and crab species that are being overfished up here. Karen and David's favorites are the octopuses. This one-year-old octopus is greeting them gently. The animal came here from a private aquarium. The owner was not able to keep it because it had grown too big. The octopus is only here temporarily. The plan is to release him soon. Up until this point, the octopus has only known the safety of his tank. He was fed on time every day and did not have to feed himself. Nevertheless, the biologists are certain that the octopus will be fine once released. Their incredible intelligence has been proven over and over again, and it will help this little aquarium octopus in the wild. It's time. There's nothing in the way of his release anymore. Octopuses are solitary animals. They do not live in a group and are very capable of solving even complex problems. Karen and David are on their way to the Shallon. This octopus shows how intelligent they really are. Its home is right underneath the docks, which means that its meals are assured because the animal feeds on the cuttings that the fishermen throw in the water while cleaning their catch at the end of the day. Captain Dave wants to leave as soon as possible because it's already late in the afternoon. The time at the end of the day was chosen on purpose. It gives the octopus the opportunity to look for a suitable home in the dark of night, which makes it safer for him. They could have released him near the docks as well. That would have been easier but there's already too much competition there, and they wanted to make it easier for this little guy. Okay. 
It's almost 60 feet deep here. Karen and Dave know this area well. There are many rocks with caves and crevices where the octopus can find a good home. They are sure he will make it here. That's why they chose this spot. Plus, this is one of their favorite dive spots, and it will give them the opportunity to check in on their little fosterling. A few last strokes, and then it's time to say goodbye. Our next destination is closer to the shore, and it's located right next to a fish cannery. Two giant octopuses are trying to escape and are doing their best to camouflage themselves. And this is the reason for their hasty escape. Every year, with the beginning of the salmon run, large schools of horn sharks also migrate into this area. Sharks and octopuses are competitors for the same food. And this is what attracts all these sharks and octopuses. A tube leads from the cannery into the ocean. Ground up salmon is dumped through this tube every day. A true land of milk and honey for many ocean inhabitants. The more concentrated the fish stock, the denser the concentration of predators. Fortunately for us, there are no blue sharks in the water, just the relatively harmless horn sharks. It's not just the sharks that are interested in the salmon scraps. So are these giant starfishes. As the competition for food gets more and more intense, it turns into a feeding frenzy. It's not easy to convince a starfish to let go of its food. Horn sharks are also called dogfish, and they're not willing to share anything. This starfish not only loses its food, but also an arm in the process. ghoulish and exciting at the same time. Close to the Shallon, everything is calm. This octopus has decided not to be part of this bubbling cauldron on the ocean floor and has taken up his resting spot underneath the shallon. A little further away and well hidden, we find what we've been looking for all along, a cave with a female giant octopus that's tending to her eggs. She has hung the egg clusters from the roof of her cave and is constantly blowing oxygen on them and gently cleaning them with her arms. She's been doing this for months and has not eaten anything during this time. All she has done is tend to her precious eggs. Once the young have all hatched, she will have lost all her strength and die. It seems that they are about to hatch. Even inside their eggs, 
the little octopuses are already able to control the color cells on their skin's surface. We can see their eyes very clearly, and also their dark ink sac. It's exhausting for them to hatch out of their egg, one baby octopus after another. This is the end of our expedition into the realm of the giant squids and the giant octopuses. They are mysterious and unusual, equipped with either eight or ten tentacles, and some armed with dangerous weapons. But nevertheless, they are extraordinary and just simply beautiful.